So today we are shifting gears and continuing on with our lecture on the circulatory system. Specifically, we're looking at the heart and blood vessels. Um, you can see we have a lot of learning outcomes to cover today. Probably one of the most important things that I want you to be able to do is to draw and diagram a cardiac circulation. That is, draw the heart and be able to trace the path of blood through the heart and all the blood vessels and tell me, you know, how does the blood pressure change as we go through this loop? How does the oxygenation change? Because it's, if you can do that one essential thing, I probably won't ask you to draw on the test, it will help you to answer a lot of questions that have to do with the heart, both here in lecture and also in the laboratory class. Okay, so the heart is part of the circulatory system along with the blood vessels in the blood. The heart is the pump that pumps the blood through, and the blood vessels are the plumbing, and of course the blood is the tissue that we're pumping through there as well. Okay, the heart is located in an area called the mediastinum, or mediastinum if you're British. Okay, so this is just the area in the chest, in the ventral wall of the chest, it's surrounded by the lungs. So the mediastinal cavity is surrounded by the pleural cavity in there. So if you hear the term mediastinum, that's what we're talking about. Now the heart itself is covered by a fiber sac called the pericardium. And uh, hopefully during lab this year, you'll get a chance to look at a cow heart or a sheep heart with a pericardium still attached because it looks like something that should not be inside of a body. Um, especially when it's been fixed in formaldehyde, the pericardium is a tough white fiber sac. It looks like you, know, you open up the animal, you're like, somebody left the shopping bag in here. And it's just this fibrous connective tissue. And it's there for a couple of reasons. It protects the heart, and it also gives a little bit of lubrication to prevent friction of the heart on the surrounding organs. Because the pericardium is really, think of it not as a, a sac, but a bubble. This is the whole fluid-filled sac. <clears throat> this is the outside of the sac. This is the inside. And then in between those layers, there's a little bit of fluid that, as the heart beats, Okay, this fluid helps to reduce the friction between that and the adjacent organs. So it's a very important sac, and sometimes the sac becomes full of too much fluid. How do you think that would affect the heart? Yeah, it would make it harder for the heart to expand and contract. It used to be like at least in the first five seasons of Grey's Anatomy, there was always some episode where somebody got cardiac tamponade, and you know, some, you know, lovely looking nurse or, or doctor would go in there with a giant needle and put it in somebody's chest who's just about to die and drain all this fluid out of the pericardial sac and all of a sudden they would just wake back up and feel a lot better. Um, but the pericardial sac is important because it does reduce friction. It has an outer fibrous layer and then an inner, and here we call visceral layer. What does viscera mean? Surrounding an organ. Surrounding an organ. Okay and it has a serous layer. A serous layer is just a layer that secretes a little bit of fluid, in this case, fluid that will line our pericardial sac. Okay, if we take a look at the heart, we've removed the outside covering, removed the pericardium, and we have an outside of epicardium on the outside. The inside part here is called myocardium. What does myo mean? Muscle, so it's made up of what kind of muscle? Cardiac muscle and then endocardium in here, which is lined with epithelial tissue. It's important that it's lined well so that we don't have reactions with our platelets as they go through the heart. Okay, major blood vessels of the heart. Um, first of all, we have our vena cava. And in a dog or a cat, we wouldn't call this the superior vena cava, we call it the cranial vena cava. Okay, and we also have a caudal vena cava down here as well. Okay. Vena cava are just giant veins that are bringing blood back to the heart from the caudal part of the body and from the head and the neck. Okay, so they're carrying deoxygenated blood. And then we have something called the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery, now what was the definition of arteries and veins, first of all? Arteries carry blood away from the heart, veins carry blood towards the heart. Okay, a lot of people think, well, arteries carry oxygenated blood. In most cases that's true, but here's a case where it's not. Okay, so the best definition is that arteries carry blood away from the heart. So here's the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery carries blood away from the heart, but this blood is deoxygenated. It's bringing it from the right ventricle 
uh, up to what we call, this is actually the pulmonary trunk, which branches into left and right pulmonary arteries, which go to the lungs. Okay, so pulmonary means lungs. And then we have pulmonary veins, okay, that enter back into the heart. Okay, they're bringing oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the heart. And again, this is a vein, you would think normally deoxygenated, but because it's the pulmonary vein, it's oxygenated. And then the aorta. The aorta is the largest, uh, in diameter, it's the largest artery in the body. Uh, very important. It looks like a candy cane. So we have ascending aorta, the arch of the aorta, and then descending aorta down here. The aorta is important because it is a some, somewhat elastic blood vessel. Because when the heart contracts, what do you think happens to the pressure in the blood vessels? It goes up. Okay, what do we call that pressure that we feel when the heart contracts? The pulse, and then systole or systolic pressure. So what's the normal systolic pressure for a person? 120 yeah, 120 is the systolic, 80 is the diastolic. For a person, and in dogs and cats, it should be around there too. The point is that when the heart is relaxing, does your blood pressure drop down to zero? No. Why would that be bad? You'd pass out, you'd pass out and be like, I'm what? Hey. You know, <laughs> it would not be a very good way to live. So one of the ways that we still have residual pressure in the blood vessels, even when the heart's relaxing, is because the aorta is very good at storing energy. It has elastic tissue in there. It's like the, it's like the elastic band on those tidy whitey underwear. And so you stretch it when the ventricles contract, blood shoots through there and the aorta will expand and then as the ventricles relax, that elastic tissue will reflexively contract again to keep some residual pressure up in the blood vessels while the heart is relaxing. It's a very important uh, artery. Uh, and then we have our right and left coronary arteries. What do these do? They supply blood to the heart. To the actual heart muscle, which seems weird. You're like, there's all kinds of blood going through there. And we've got these giant vessels going through there, but these, the heart can't absorb oxygen very efficiently from the ventricles themselves. So we have these little bitty manini blood vessels that are coming off the aorta that supply the heart. And then we have a right and left and they branch off. Um, the point is in humans, what is the problem with the coronary arteries? They get clogged up. They get clogged up with like bacon grease and things like that. And so we have to get bypasses and stuff like that. But we don't see that a whole lot in cats and dogs. Uh, they usually don't live that long that they're going to have type of coronary artery disease. But um, it is still the same anatomy supplying the heart. Okay, so there's everything. The other thing you need to know is this pointy part of the heart right here is called the apex. Okay. Okay, so the heart is a four-chambered pump okay, made up of two atria and two ventricles. Now, the ventricles themselves are divided by something called the ventricular septum, ventricular septum. Okay. The ventricles have more work to do than the atria. All the atria do is they collect the blood, in this case, in the right atrium as it comes back to the heart, and then it goes and squeezes that blood into the right ventricle. It's not very strong. Okay. It doesn't have to do much. The ventricles, on the other hand, the right ventricle pumps to the lungs, the left ventricles pumps to what we call the systemic circuit, which is everywhere else in the body. So it has to be very muscular, very strong. The atria don't have to be. They're just going from here to here. Ventricles have to pump a lot further. Okay, so in between the atria and the ventricles, we have atrial conventricular valves. Why do you think we have valves in the heart? We're going backwards. Because when the heart contracts, when it goes through systole, the atria contract first, they pump a little blood in there, and then the ventricles contract afterwards. So when the ventricles contract, we don't want the blood just going back into the atria. Instead, we want those valves to snap shut, and we want that blood to go out the aorta or the pulmonary trunk. So that's why we have valves. And these are called atrioventricular valves. There's one on the right and one on the left. They're both AV valves. Okay. The one on the right is called the tricuspid. Okay. The one on the left is called the bicuspid or mitral. The way that I remember this is that tricuspid and right have an R in it. Okay? Tri and right. 
Okay, and here's what they look like sort of in, um, in a real heart, first of all. This is um, the mitral valve, okay, so it's a bicuspid valve. And then attached to it, you can see something called the chordy tendony. Um, what does that mean? They're tendinous cords. Do you ever heard of your heart strings? Yeah. These are your heart strings, okay? The heart strings are there to um, basically support the valve and prevent it from prolapsing, prevent it from going the other way. So they're like guy wires attached to these little papillary muscles that you know, keep the, the valves from blowing back the other direction. That being said, sometimes we do have a valve that is what we call incompetent. Uh, and this means it's, it's not working properly and it's letting blood go back and forth, which it shouldn't do. So other things about the heart, we've got our semilunar valves. These are valves that uh, regulate blood entrance into the great vessels. And the great vessels here, I mean, are the pulmonary artery, pulmonary trunk, and the aorta. And so these allow blood to go up the vessels when the ventricles are contracting, but prevent it from going backwards when the ventricles are relaxing. So again, the whole point of valves is keeping things moving one direction. So we have a pulmonic uh, or pulmonary semilunar valve and an aortic semilunar valve. Okay, semilunar just because they kind of look half moon shaped. This is the ventricles with the atria removed. So here you can see the tricuspid and the bicuspid valves. And then we've got our semilunar valves, pulmonary semilunar, aortic semilunar valves. Okay. okay, so circulation of the heart. There's two circuits you need to know about. The first circuit is something called the pulmonary circuit. And pulmonary means what? lungs. So the pulmonary circuit is pumping blood to the lungs. And so if you want to see where the pulmonary circuit starts, okay, it starts, you know, sort of down here on the right side of the heart. Uh, incidentally, I'm not dyslexic, by the way. I'm sitting there, you need to talk about this heart as if it were your own heart. So I know looking at it, it's on your left side, but imagine it being your own heart. So this is the right side of the heart, and this is the left side of the heart. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so blood is going to be pumped from here up to the pulmonary circuit into the lungs, and blood is pumped through the other direction, okay, from the left ventricle and through the systemic circuit this way. The systemic circuit goes to everywhere else in the body, okay? So it, in fact, has to be even stronger, the left side of the heart, because it's pumping through a lot more blood vessels than we are with a pulmonary uh, circuit. So that's what, if you look at the heart and cross section, if you cut, anyone ever eat, eaten heart? Mm -hmm. Yeah? It's, okay, it's always like chicken hearts, I guess. Okay, that's good. I was, I, I've had chicken livers wrapped in bacon, not chicken hearts. Oh yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay. Okay, yeah, it's a heart, yeah, I've eaten the hearts. No, I was in New Guinea last year, and a friend of mine's like, oh, you've got to eat this, it's like a plate lunch place, and they come back with just a heart. And I'm like, they didn't chop it up or anything. It was just a stewed heart, and I, I couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> anyway, the left chamber is going to be much more muscular because it has to pump a lot further through that systemic circuit. Okay, so one of the things I'm going to grill you on in the test is you need to be able to tell me how the blood pressure and oxygenation change throughout these two loops, the pulmonary loop and the systemic loop because it's really important to understand why we have four chambers and why we have higher pressure in one place and lower pressure in another. So, um, I want you to get out a piece of paper, just a random piece of paper. In fact, I think you can use the back of your last page that should be blank, because we're gonna draw today. Yeah, and anybody remember who Bob Ross was? He would sit there on public access TV and he'd be like, yeah, let's paint a cloud. Let's make it a happy cloud. He had big hair like this, and so you imagine today, God bless his heart, he's passed on, but I'm here today, so um, I'm going to show you how to draw the heart. And I'm going to use PowerPoint instead, but keep in mind, drawing on the board is also going to happen as well um, later on, but you should be able to draw these things for yourself in order to understand how the heart works. All right, so we're going to start with a circle. Okay. Now, I can't draw very well, so I don't need you to draw an anatomically correct heart and then it you know, is pointed at the end or anything like that, but just get a conceptual heart. That's what we're aiming for. 
So we've got this whole heart, and we're going to divide it into how many chambers? Four. 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 Okay, so we start with our interventricular septum right here, dividing left and right sides of the ha heart. Okay, and then we have uh, our atria up here. Okay. So what is this chamber? Which side is that? Right, right so that's the right atrium, and this would be the left ventricle. So go ahead and label those. Right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. Yeah, don't... I know it's confusing, because you look at it, you're like, that's not left. Exactly. Okay. It's, it's, this is the heart guy's anatomical terms. He's facing you. Okay. Now, the first blood vessel we're going to draw starts the pulmonary circuit. It comes out of the right ventricle. The right side of the heart is pumping to the lungs. Remember, pulmonary means lungs. So that is our pulmonary artery. Okay. And where does gas exchange happen in the lungs? What kind of blood vessels is, are those? You're thinking bronchioles and things. That's the airways. But the, the blood vessels themselves are capillaries, right? Capillaries are where exchange happens. So we're going to draw some capillaries right there. And then we have our pulmonary vein. Remember, veins carry blood from, you know, back to the heart. In this case, the pulmonary vein brings the blood back to the left atrium. Okay. Again, there's more than one pulmonary vein. I'm just trying to draw it simplistically here. So this is what we call the pulmonary circuit. Okay. It leaves by the right ventricle, pulmonary artery, to our pulmonary capillaries, and our pulmonary vein. <coughs> now we're going to draw our systemic circuit. So systemic circuit uh, is on the other side of the heart. So coming out of the left ventricle, we have our aorta. Now, I know the aorta comes out in the top of the heart, but it's hard for me to draw that, so I'll just show it coming out this way. Aorta is an artery, okay, and it goes to our eventually systemic capillaries. Systemic here just means the tissues, the rest of the body. These are our systemic capillaries. Okay. And then after that, the blood is returned back to the heart by what blood vessel? The vena cava. Cranial caudal vena cava. Mm -hmm. Vena cava is singular, or vena cavae is plural, because we do have a, a cranial and a caudal one. All right. So we've got our pulmonary circuit, and we've got our systemic circuit. Which one is longer or more circuitous? systemic, right? Okay, so it requires a greater force. That's why the left side of our heart tends to be more muscular. Now we've got the heart drawn, but now we need to talk about pressure and oxygenation and so forth. What do you think about the oxygenation in our vena cava? Is it high oxygen or low oxygen? Low. Why is it low oxygen? It's coming back to the heart, probably low oxygen in this case, because it's been through the tissues. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's what it is. So we'll draw with a blue arrow right there. Low oxygen. Now, we're going to stay low oxygen as we go through the right ventricle and then even the pulmonary artery. So this is one of those things where if I ask you on a test, you know, tell me about the degree of oxygenation in the pulmonary artery, people will say, well, it's an artery, so it must have oxygenated blood. Here's a case where that's not true because the pulmonary artery is carrying oxygen uh, depopulate blood, low oxygen blood, and the reason it's leaving is it's going to go to the lungs so we can get oxygenated, right? Okay. So pulmonary artery goes to the pulmonary capillaries. Now, let's talk about pressure as well. In the vena cava, what do you think our pressure was? Low. Why low? It's coming back to the heart. <coughs> coming back to the heart. So it's low pressure. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a rule of thumb is that any time blood goes through the capillary bed, it slows down. Capillaries are like the checkout line at Long's on coupon Senior Citizen Day. Okay. It's oh, not not go. Oh, yeah, sorry. Or on any day. It's Long's is usually pretty slow. Uh, anyway. So if we look at what happens in the pulmonary capillaries is that as the blood goes to the pulmonary capillaries, not only does it slow down, 
but it also grabs a hold of oxygen. Oxygen moves in, carbon dioxide moves out. So it goes from being blue to red, showing that it has oxygen in it now. So pulmonary capillaries, we pick up oxygen, but we lose pressure. Okay? And so the pressure coming out of the pulmonary capillaries is low, but the oxygen content is high. So the pulmonary vein is carrying oxygenated blood, but it's low pressure blood. And that's why we're going back to the heart. Okay? That's why we go two pumps through the heart to get to the rest of the body. There are some vertebrates like fish that have a two-chambered heart where they go to the gills and then they go to the rest of the body. Why don't you think we do that here? Why, why do we have to have a four-chambered heart? We have to go farther, and we have you know, a higher metabolism. Fishes are, for the most part, cold-blooded, and so their metabolism can you know, basically tolerate this weak circulatory system that's you know, getting blood to the body at a certain rate, whereas mammals that have uh, high metabolism need uh, this really efficient circulatory system to get oxygen and nutrients to the tissues in a timely manner. So that's why we have to have two passes through the heart. Okay. So the blood comes back to the left side of the heart and it's going to go through the heart again in order to get repressurized. So it's high in oxygen, low in CO2, but also low in pressure. It then enters the left ventricle, because all they do, the, you know, the left atrium goes eh, and then puts it in the left ventricle. And then the left ventricle contracts, a very powerful chamber, and then forces it into the aorta. Okay. Aorta is an artery. This is really high pressure blood. It's still high in oxygen and low in CO2. And then it comes up to the systemic capillaries. These are the capillary beds where exchange happens all over the body. What's going to happen here, do you think? It's going to slow down. Yeah, so oxygen is going to diffuse into the tissues, and carbon dioxide is going to diffuse in. So basically, oxygen is going to go down. The, that's why we're showing it turning to blue, because we're more oxygen poor, and CO2 is going to go up. Capillaries are where gas exchange happens, and this is where we're going to uh, lose oxygen and gain CO2, and in the process, the blood slows down, and so the pressure drops. Okay? Be able to do this in your sleep. Get up in the morning and see if you can draw this. Draw it upside down. It's really important because, you know, I'll ask you on the test, tell me about the oxygen concentration and the pressure inside the pulmonary artery. What would you say? High pressure, high pressure low, oxygen. low oxygen. What about CO2? Uh, high, CO2. high CO2. So questions like that, you should be able to tell it to me. And I'll also give you a list of structures. I'll say, OK, uh, pulmonary artery, uh, atrioventricular valve, and, and some other valves. I'll, I'll say, put these things in order of circulation. Mm -hmm. And in for order you, to be able to do that, you need to be able to draw this thing. And sometimes I have to think my way through it and actually do a little drawing when answering this question. So please, please, please be able to do this drawing because it will help you in understanding the circulation of the heart, which isn't just important for this lecture. It's also important for our next lecture on the respiratory system. Okay, so heart muscle is different than skeletal muscle. Um, first of all, the cells are relatively short, around 60 to 100 microns. Instead of having lots of nuclei, they have one or two. Uh, you can see that the cells themselves do branch. And then in between, we have these intercalated discs. What was the point of intercalated discs? Um, yeah. It allows cells to communicate their electrical signals. Because the heart is like, when the heart's contracting, correctly. It's like a really good wave at a football game. You know, the wave where somebody stands up and does this, right? Okay. It starts at one end of the heart and goes to the other one. And if it does that efficiently, blood gets pumped out of the heart very efficiently each time. If, on the other hand, you had that one idiot cell that's standing up at the wrong time and it's contracting while everyone else is relaxing, then we have a problem. And that's what we have when we have arrhythmias. So it's important that the cells be able to communicate through electrical charges, and that's why they have these intercalated discs, which are basically uh, gap junctions. Okay, another way that the heart differs with skeletal muscle is the means of stimulation. Okay. 
Skeletal muscle had to be stimulated by what? Nerve impulses from the brain or from the spinal cord. The heart can be stimulated on its own, right? It's autorhythmic. It has its own nodes which control contraction. Okay. The other thing is that in skeletal muscle we had motor units. What was a motor unit? Okay, a motor unit is a neuron, a nerve cell, in all the skeletal muscle cells that it controls. So here's our neuron. So this one controls three muscle cells. And we have lots of motor units, right? We can have or a thousand um, different neurons that control different muscle fibers in the same muscle. The question is, when you contract your biceps muscle, when you pick something up, am I using every cell in there? No, not right now, right? It's pretty light. Okay. So motor units are either turned on or turned off depending on how much work I need to do. So I look at that, it doesn't look very heavy, so my brain just sends a couple messages via maybe one or, you know, a few motor units and the rest of the cells just rest. Okay. And so not all cells are contracting. In the heart, however, all cells are participating in the contraction. It's a group effort, and so they have to be synchronized. Um, okay, so cardiac muscle cells are autorhythmic. They're self-excitable. Um, when I took physiology, way back then, we actually opened up a turtle. Came in one day, big old baby pool of turtles in there, and took the turtle out, and then humanely pith the turtle and then cut it open with a hacksaw. So everyone's gro grossed out, yes, but then you see this beating heart, okay? And we were able to do different experiments and look at the effects of different stimulants on the heart and things like that. Uh, but the heart is beating wildly, okay? It's very animated <coughs> and it beats on its own even after it's removed, uh, severed from the, uh, the nervous system. So the heart has this intrinsic rhythm that can be modified by the brain. The brain is not setting the initial rhythm. <coughs> so, the rhythm is set at something called the sinoatrial node, SA node. It's around 100 beats per minute. Now, what is the normal heart rate for a dog, would you say? Say a Great Dane. Hmm? Yeah, it depends. Uh, dogs, I mean, anybody know what the, the average range is for heart rate in dogs? I didn't even know what the accepted range was, so I looked it up. And when you look it up, depending on the reference, you get something preposterous like, uh, resting heart rate varies between 60 and 140 beats per minute. <laughs> depends on age, depends on size of the dog, right? Okay, little bitty dog, <laughs> you know, those guys are going to have a really fast heart rate. Generally, things that are smaller have a higher heart rate than things that are larger. Uh, if you look at something like a, a big lab or something like that, it could be in the 60s. Okay? So it just depends. Um, but let's say that 100 beats a minute would be too high for a resting heart rate for a Labrador retriever. So the heart itself wants to beat at 100 beats per minute, but it can be modified by the brain. The brain can say, slow down, slow down. Okay? But the SAO node automatically uh, fires off an impulse on average 80 to 100 times per minute. Uh, from then, it will go to the AV node. I think we, here, yeah, there we go. So SA node, we have a delay. Then we conduct it to the atrioventricular node, okay, where we have a second impulse go off, second depolarization. And then it travels down the septum through the AV bundle, down our left and right bundle branches, and to the apex of the heart outward. Okay. Now, it's important because where does contraction of the heart start? At the bottom of the heart, right? At the tip of the ventricles, it starts here when the ventricles contract because which way is the blood going? Up. up. It's going up to our great vessels, our pulmonary trunk and our aorta. Um, the most efficient way to squeeze a toothpaste tube is what? From the bottom, right? Okay, that's how, you know, people, if you're trying to be really efficient, whereas what happens if your heart started contracting here and went this way? It's going to send blood into a dead-end wall. So it's important that these electrical events be coordinated so that we have a uh, contraction of the heart. So these electrical events will hopefully lead to the same mechanical events that will help force blood out of the heart.
Okay, and our Purkinje fibers are found in the walls of the heart, and they have a certain depolarization time as well. You don't need to know the time periods on here, but you do need to know what the order is. SA node, a pause, AV node, AV bundle, okay, and then our Purkinje fibers. And the reason there has to be a pause here is because depolarization, or the impulse, is going to lead to what? An impulse, an electrical charge forms in that muscle, and that's going to cause the muscle to contract. contract. So there's a pause here while the AV node depolarizes, allows for contraction of the vent, the, excuse me, contraction of the atria before contraction of the ventricles. You don't want them trying to contract at the same time, right? It's not going to be efficient. So the atria contract first. Okay. You've heard of an ECG electrocardiogram, right? Sometimes it's called an EKG. Does anybody know wh why? Amanda? Cardio. Yeah. Das cardio, yes. Yeah. Ich bin. Yeah. Yeah. All right. She's exactly right. So we use ECG or EKG. Either one is fine. And everybody's seen an electrocardiogram, right? Okay. You've seen on TV and stuff like that. They use them in the veterinary clinic, hopefully, when the animal's under anesthesia to probably be hooked up at least to a heart monitor to make sure that everything's okay. Um, and so there's different waves on there. There's a P wave, a QRS, and a T wave. Now you do not need to know the times, but you do need to be able to recognize the waves and understand what they mean. So the P wave is atrial depolarization. That's this little bump right here. Okay. And that happens when the SA node depolarizes. Atrial depolarization. So atria depolarize, and soon after, they're going to contract. The contraction would probably start right in here somewhere. Okay. Next is the PR interval, uh, which is just start of P to end of R. Okay. This is the time it takes for the electrical impulses to be conducted to the ventricles. And the next one is our QRS complex is ventricular depolarization. The ventricles are depolarizing, and soon after, they're going to start contracting. This is the actual contraction time of the ventricles. This is the contraction time of the atria. Okay. So this is a much larger electrical event, okay. depolarization of the ventricles. Okay. During this whole period, the ventricles are depolarized, and then we reach our T wave, which is repolarization of the ventricles. They go back to their initial charge. So we saw depolarization of the atria, depolarization of the ventricles, and repolarization of the ventricles. How come we don't see repolarization of the atria? Anyone know? So that's happening while this QRS wave is happening. But the QRS wave is so big, it masks everything else out. So we just see atrial depolarization, ventricular depolarization, and then ventricular repolarization. Big point is, you know, as a vet tech, you're not going to be analyzing electrocardiograms and saying, well, this person had, or this dog has, you know, a prolonged uh, TR interval or something like that. But you're going to make sure that, you know, how close they are together and do they have a P wave for every QRS wave. So you should know what a normal one looks like because sometimes you may see an abnormal EKG. Has anyone seen an abnormal one? We had uh, one of the OSPCA dogs, this was years ago, when we first started that, I forget the breed, but it anyway had a reaction to one of the anesthetics and it started to throw off these premature ventricular contractions and, and you could tell and look at it on the EKG and so uh, Dr. Albutri was able to treat it uh, with a little bit injection of lidocaine. So it's important to be able to, to spot these things and identify you know, what's called uh, an arrhythmia. Okay, so this is a normal rhythm. We have a normal P wave, atrial depolarization, QRS wave, ventricular depolarization, T wave. That's our ventricular repolarization. Down here, we're missing some P waves. Where are the P waves created? At what node? SA node. So in this case, something's wrong with the SA node. The weird thing about nodes of the heart is they're pacemakers, right? And the heart pays attention to the fastest pacemaker. Sometimes, SA node checks out. It's not working. Who's the next pacemaker? AV node. AV node, it can do the job. The heart will start 
paying attention to the AV node, but the AV node only depolarizes about 40 or 50 times per minute, which is oftentimes not enough to keep the blood pumping uh, fast enough. And it also doesn't have cause contraction of the atria. And so if you see a missing P wave on there, sometimes it's what we call a junctional rhythm. This means something's not going wrong. Something's going wrong with our SA node. And then you can have something called heart block, where we're actually missing some QRS waves, where even though we're having depolarization of the SA node, somehow it's not reaching the AV node, or at least it's not reaching the left and right bundle branches. Yeah. OK. Now, rhythms that you should be able to identify have to do more with rate. So there's a normal rhythm, somewhere between 60 and 140 beats per minute. And then there's something called bradycardia. Bradycardia means what? Slow heart rate. If normal, if you know, Fifi comes in and she normally has a heart rate of 120 beats per minute because she's a <laughs> little hyperactive dog, and the dog doctor decides to put her on Dextomator for, um, let's say, an x ray. Anybody know what Dextomator is? Okay. It's a, well, yeah, it's a downer, it's an anesthetic, it's a general anesthetic we can use that can be reversed fairly quickly. So if you need to do something like an x-ray or, or something that's going to require some manipulation, you can sedate them with it and even anesthetize them with it. And then as soon as you're done, you can reverse it. But one of the things about this is like you can have a dog that normally has a resting heart rate of 80, and then they get in there and, and instead of hearing bump, 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 all of a sudden it's like boom, boom. And you know, as a technician, you're so nervous because this dog is in bradycardia, and you know it's in bradycardia, and you're just like going, is, this, is that the last heartbeat I'm going to hear? Um, and so some medications cause bradycardia. Sometimes it can be you know, very bad. Uh, in that case, it's sort of expected. But you definitely want to you know, worry about a dog that's having bradycardia on other anesthetics because it might mean it's too deep. Uh, and then we have tachycardia. Uh, tachycardia is just a faster than normal heart rate. Again, given that the heart rate for dogs is 60 to 140 beats per minute, tachycardia is going to depend on the individual. You know, Fifi, who's like three pounds, if she has a heart rate, a resting heart rate of you know, like 90 or 100, well, that might be normal for her. But would you know a heart rate of uh, 100 and 120 be normal for a Labrador Retriever? No. Okay. In the act of running, sure, right. Well, we're talking about resting heart rate, yeah. In the act of running, yeah, their heart rate can get much higher than that. But if they're just sitting there and their heart rate's that high, it can mean a lot of things. Particularly, it can also just be an indication of pain. Sometimes they're stressed, pain, something's going on to make their heart rate faster. And then you have a rhythm like this, which is never good. It's called ventricular fibrillation. Whereas instead of the heart contracting as a synchronized unit, you know, where the first guy stands up and then everyone else does the wave, it's just fluttering. It's doing this. So when I was in college, we actually put our heart into fibrillation and just sat there and quivered. And you're like, wow. Not my own heart, our turtle's heart, sorry. We put our turtle into fibrillation, and it's just very disorganized. And the reason this is bad is how well do you think it's pumping right now? Not well. Not getting enough oxygen, probably not pumping blood at all. And so the important thing, there's two events going in the heart. There's the electrical event, and then soon after there's a contraction event. P wave, which is sort of hard to see here, atrial depolarization. Soon after that, we're going to have atrial contraction. Okay, QRS wave, ventricular depolarization. Soon after that, what's going to happen? Ventricular contraction. Okay, so these are the electrical events. These are the mechanical events. Okay, simplified. So this is what we call the cardiac cycle, and it involves systole and diastole. Um, now, systole, a lot of people are thinking that like island nation down by Italy. Um, <laughs> but in this case, systole is the contraction of a heart chamber. When the heart's contracting, it's in systole. When it's react relaxing, it's in diastole. Okay? So remember that the atria and the ventricles don't contract at the same time. The atria actually contract first and then the ventricles. Now, it's important to point out that when the heart's filling with blood, imagine the heart is just contracted, and then it begins to relax. As the ventricles relax, what happens to their volume? It increases. And as that happens, the pressure falls. 
and they actually create a suction. So a lot of the blood that ends up in the ventricles happens because of ventricular sucking. Okay. It doesn't involve the atria pumping or not. The ventricles are just expanding, and as they expand, they suck blood from the uh, vena cava uh, and from the, you know, the, um, uh, the, uh, the other blood vessels coming to the left ventricle. So it's just sucking going on. And then when the ventricles are about 70% full, that's when the atria go, and they squirt a little bit more blood in there. Atria don't do much, okay? Now, after that's happened, the ventricles will begin to contract. When the ventricles contract, the AV valves snap shut, right? And that prevents blood from going back the other direction. And that diverts blood up to our great blood vessels, our pulmonary trunk, and our aorta. Okay. Once the pressure in there is great enough, our SL valves will open, and when that happens, blood will move out the pulmonary trunk and out the aorta. Now, what is hypertension? Hyper, hypertension. Higher than normal blood pressure. So imagine if you have an animal that has high blood pressure, and say normally systolic pressure should be, let's say 120, and let's say systolic pressure is 180. It's going to have to overcome that pressure before the blood can bypass this door, before this door can open. And so having high blood pressure, hypertension, makes it harder on the heart to beat. The, the heart has to beat more forcefully, more strongly, to get those valves to open up. So having back pressure on these blood vessels is never good. Okay, have you ever listened to the heart sounds on a cat or a dog? Okay, we, so next time you get a chance, you know, bring in some stethoscopes if you want to take them home or just practice on yourselves. There's two sounds you should hear, uh, S1 and S2. It's, what does a heart sound like? Yeah, it's lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Okay, the first sound you hear, S1, is the closure of the AV valves when the ventricles start to contract. The ventricles go contract, AV valves snap shut. Okay, but then as the ventricles relax, the SL valve snaps shut, and that's our S2. In truth, there's a lot more sounds than this. I'm sorry? Which one is louder? The dub, I think S2. Yeah. yeah. And it depends on where you're listening to it as well. I mean, it, they are whole classes on learning to identify other heart sounds and arrhythmias and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the simple thing you should be able to do is, is identify and say, well, this is a heartbeat. And that's S1, that's S2.